Good evening, New Life Baptist Church. I'm glad to be able to preach for you guys again this evening. Um, I will say before I start preaching, uh, please continue praying about the border issue. I uh, can't wait to get back up there and see you guys in person. I, I do miss, I miss you guys a lot. And uh, so I'm just looking forward to being able to travel up there and to just be able to preach to you in person. So let's uh, go to Hosea chapter 2. Let's go to Hosea chapter 2. And we are continuing our series in the book of Hosea. And I would say that it, you know, for me, uh, uh, preaching for this book has been a little challenging. You know, it does bring uh, quite a lot of questions. So there are a lot of things uh, to be answered. And, you know, I've not really heard a lot of preaching on Hosea. But just thinking back to what I have heard or the interpretations that I've become familiar with, I've, under, I've realized that I kind of, as, as I've studied for this book, I, uh, you know, I, I do tend to believe much of what I heard, but there are some differences that I think uh, we're going to notice in this book. And uh, I think what's important to understand in the book of Hosea is that Hosea chapter 1, chapter 2, and chapter 3 serve as an introduction to the other 11 chapters in that book. And one thing that we notice in chapter 1 is that God told the northern kingdom that they would no longer be his people and that he would no longer be their God. And so God was rejecting that physical Old Testament nation. But then God prophesied about his people, you know, receiving mercy. And of course, we saw how that ties into, you know, believers of the New Testament and how that ultimately ties to the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. Well, in Hosea chapter 2, we see something very similar as well. And I'm not going to give you the title for the sermon till the end of the sermon today. Uh, but let's start there in verse number 1. Alright, I just had to turn the light on today. Sorry. Hosea chapter 2 and verse number 1. It says, Say ye unto your brethren, Ami, and to your sisters, Ruhamah. Now those words should sound familiar to you if you remember chapter 1. But then it says, plead with your mother, plead, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband, lest her therefore put away her whoredoms out of her sight, and her adulteries from between her breasts. And so, what we uh, need to understand is, well, let, me, let me tell you the, the general idea that a lot of people hold to when it comes to the book of Hosea. And that is that we saw that in Hosea chapter 1, God asked Hosea to marry a woman of whoredoms. A woman who had not kept herself faithful and, and pure for her wedding day. And so Hosea was taken, you know, as it were, damaged goods, you know, for a wife. And one thing, I, I went back to listen to my sermon that I preached in chapter 1. One thing that I do want to clarify, in that sermon I never said that the wife Hosea takes Goma, that she committed adultery. What I was trying to say, of course, is that she was a woman that was unfaithful to her wedding day, but she wasn't necessarily someone who was unfaithful toward Hosea. The general idea in the book of Hosea is that Goma eventually becomes unfaithful toward him. She commits adultery toward him. And, and most of the reason they believe that is here in chapter 2, and then what they teach is that in chapter 3, let's go to Hosea chapter 3 and verse number 1. Let's have a read, look at that. Hosea chapter 3 verse number 1. It says, Then said the Lord unto me, Go yet, love a woman, beloved of her friend, yet an adulteress. And so the idea there is that, well, you know, Hosea's first, first wife was unfaithful. She committed adultery. Therefore, Hosea went to marry another woman. Or that Goma was uh, adulteress. And in chapter 3, Hosea is going back and winning back his first wife. Now, I don't, I don't believe any of those things. I have read these chapters over and over and over again, you know, during the last couple of weeks. And I don't, I don't believe that. I will explain to you what Hosea chapter 3 verse number 1 is about next time when we get to the next chapter. But as I said, most of that idea comes from chapter 2. And so what we see here, and I'll, I'll tell you the misunderstanding here. Because it says, say ye unto your brethren. Now look at Hosea chapter 1, verse number 9. You may remember that Hosea took Gomer as his wife, as I explained to you. And they had three children. And the children's names that we're looking at here is the second and the third. Well, in Hosea chapter 1, verse number 9, it says, Then said God, call his name Lo-Ami. Now remember, Ami is mentioned in Hosea chapter 2, verse number 1. Okay? Lo-Ami. 
for ye are not my people and I will not be your God. Okay, so what we learn there is lo ami means not my people. Okay, so ami on its own without the lo means my people, if that makes sense. Lo ami means not my people, but ami means my people. And now let's look at verse number six, Hosea chapter one, verse number six. It says, and she conceived again and bare a daughter. And God said unto him, call her name Lo Ruhamah, for I will no more have mercy upon the house of Israel, but I will utterly take them away. So Ruhama means mercy, and Lo Ruhama means no mercy. All right. So let's go back to Hosea chapter 2 and verse number 1. And so those that believe that Gomer became an adulterous woman in marriage will teach or have taught, so some people have teach, that Hosea is telling his secondborn and his thirdborn, uh, Ami and Ruhama, to plead with their mother. To go, hey mom, stop being an adulterous woman. Stop cheating on dad. You know, people teach that Hosea sends his own children to correct their mother. And you know, when I, I remember when I heard that, it just didn't sit well with me. It didn't make any sense, all right? Um, now, here's the thing. I actually believe that Goma remained faithful after she got married. You know, she may very well... Look, I, I can't prove this to you from the Bible, but she, she could have very well been a, a great mother, a great wife. You know, she probably cleaned up her life of her past. You know, went, no longer went in that horrible, you know, uh, perverted ways of living, but just remained as a faithful wife. That's what I personally believe. I can't prove that. But those that say that she became an adulterous woman, that cheated on her husband, can't prove that either. Okay? But they use this passage to say that Hosea is sending his children to get their, mom, their mother right. Okay? Now, why doesn't this sit well with me? Well, number one, if Hosea is sending his own children to confront their mother about their adultery, that just seems unusual. Uh, Hosea, who's supposed to be a man of God, and we know he's preaching God's word, we know that he's an unpopular preacher. We know he's preaching God's judgment on the wicked nation of Israel. You're going to tell me that man can't run his own household? You're going to tell me that man can't keep his wife in subjection? Can't lead his wife? Or even if his wife was unfaithful, you're going to tell me he's not taking it upon himself as the leader of his own home to go sort out his wife? That he's sending his own children? You know, that, would, that just doesn't sit right with me whatsoever when we consider uh, the Lord. But secondly... It's not Lo Ami or Lo Ruhama, his children that he's sending. No, these are different names. It's not Lo Ami, it's just Ami. And it's not Lo Ruhama, it's Ruhama. Okay? So that's the second reason. The names don't even match up. Even though the names are similar, and they're similar for a reason, but the names don't match up with his children's names. And the third reason I don't believe he's sending his children to confront their mother is because in verse number one it says, Say ye unto your brethren. Ami and to your sisters Ruhama and so Ami and Ruhama are not being described as his children but they're being described as his brethren all right now let's put this all together what is going on here well what 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 is happening is of course we saw the illustration in chapter one that Israel had become as it were a whorish wife to God okay and of course Hosea, being one man who is faithful to God, one believer, of course, this nation, even though this nation as a whole rejected God and, re and was that unfaithful wife, symbolically, there were still people in the land that were faithful to God. There were still believers, of course, uh, in the land. And, of course, Hosea is one of those. And so when he's talking about his brethren, what's Ami? Am I, oh, am I? Am I means... Um, uh, sorry, what was it? Am I means my people. Okay, it's not not my people. Am I means my people. And Ruhama means mercy. Or those people that God would be merciful toward. And so God is telling Hosea, go to your brethren who are my people. Go to your brethren who I have had mercy upon. And get them to go to their mother, which of course is the nation of Israel. Okay, talking about the, the city and tell her, plead with, the, with that uh, nation. Plead with the wickedness of, you know, or the sin, uh, pre you know, preach against the sin of that wicked nation. And so Hosea is trying to get the support of other believers, other people that are the people of God, you know, and other uh, 
you know, Hosea had a few contemporaries. One contemporary of his, one other prophet was Amos. You know, and we'll look at Amos later on. He was also a man that God used to preach against the northern kingdom of Israel. And so Hosea has been asked by God, look, gather other believers. Don't be the only one going out there preaching against the sins of the nation, but use your brethren, use the other saved people, use your brothers and sisters in the Lord to go and preach against this wicked nation. And so it's not saying that Gomer had become an adulterous woman. Again, it's using the illustration of a married woman being unfaithful to God and that his people would be the ones that would preach against the wickedness of the nation. And this is why there's nothing wrong with preachers preaching against, you know, we're in Australia, preaching against the wickedness of this nation. You know, highlighting the fact that there is, you know, uh, uh, um, you know uh, all manners of sins, there's abortions, you know, this uh, legalized same-sex uh, marriage, all this kind of nonsense that's going on in this world, it is perfectly right for God's people to preach, to call out this stuff, because that is what God requires from his prophets. Now let's keep going. Let's go to verse number three. Lest I stri strip her naked. Strip who naked? Gomer? No, not Gomer. The nation of Israel, okay? <clears throat> and set her as in the day that she was born, and make her a wilderness and set her like a dry land, and slay her with thirst. So, Gomer is not being made into a dry land, right? It's the nation of Israel. It's the, it's the country that they, they reside upon that will be made dry. And, you know, the nation will be slayed with thirst. Now, I want you to go to the book of Amos. Amos, so we're in Hosea right now. You've got the book of Joel, and then you've got the book of Amos. So, Hosea, Joel, Amos. Please go to Amos chapter 8. As I told you, Amos was a contemporary of Hosea during this time. Amos chapter 8, verse number 11. Amos chapter 8, verse number 11. The Bible reads, Behold, the days come, saith the Lord God, that I will send a famine in the land, not a famine of bread, nor a thirst for water, but of hearing the words of the Lord. And they shall wander from sea to sea, and from the north even to the east, they shall run to and fro to seek the word of the Lord and shall not find it. And so we see that Joel is preaching the same message, that God will make this land a thirsty land. This land we thirst in for, specifically the word of God, the wisdom of God, the knowledge of God. And even, you know, there will come a time when it's too late too late for them to come back to God. They're going to be overtaken by the Assyrians and they will not be able to find the instruction, the leading from God's word. Okay? Because, hey, the authorities, they've become corrupt. The preachers of God's word, they have become corrupt. They're not going to be able to find the word of God. And, you know, God sent them Amos. God sent them Hosea. But when they rejected the preachers, by default, they rejected the word of God. Let's go back to Hosea chapter 2 and verse number 4. Hosea chapter 2 verse number 4 reads, And I will not have mercy upon her children, for they be the children of whoredoms. Now understand there that there are two types of people in the nation of Israel. There are those that God has had mercy on, the believers. Okay, the saved believers, but then most of that nation is made up of non-believers. People that God would not have mercy on. People that would become, as it were, children of whoredoms because they went and served false gods. Verse number five. For their mother have played the harlot. Again, this is not speaking of Gomer. This is speaking about the nation of Israel. She's gone to play the harlot. She's been as a prostitute. She that conceived them have done shamefully. For she said, I will go after my lovers that give me my bread and my water, my wool and my flax, mine oil and my drink. And so the nation of Israel, you know, just like a prostitute, you know, uh, sells her body for money, right? Sells her body for possessions. And she has the idea that, well, it's my lovers that give me what I have, okay? But here's the thing, you know, and, and sorry, I should say that the nation of Israel, in the same way as they worship these false gods, they thought it was the false gods that gave them the blessings of the land. We'll soon see that it wasn't the false gods that blessed them on the land. It was the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob, the God of the Bible that blessed them, and they had forgotten that truth. Look at verse number 6. Therefore, behold, 
I will hedge up thy way with thorns. And so God's saying, look, I'm bringing tough times. Your productivity will be hurt. Okay? And make a wall that she shall not find her paths. God will make a wall and, you know, it will stop this nation from, uh, or, you know, God will put a stop to their sinful ways and, you know, God will, uh, you know, not allow them to continue down this spiral. And so let's keep going to verse number seven there. It says, And she, speaking of Israel, shall follow after her lovers, but she shall not overtake them, and she shall seek them, but shall not find them. Then shall she say, I will go and return to my first husband, for then was it better with me than now. And so she's hoping that her former, her, her lovers uh, will come to her rescue. But when she finds out that she, they're not helping her, when, when the nation of Israel finds out these false gods are not giving uh, the nation what it needs, she, you know, she's going to finally realize that I better go back to my first husband. Now, there's a few thoughts that I want us to consider here. You know, in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse number 4, it says, We know that an idol is nothing in the world, and that there is none other God but one. Listen, brethren, there is one God. There is one God that provides all that we have. It is the Lord God. You know, it is the one whom Jesus Christ has opened up the way so we can be with the Father one day. Jesus Christ, of course, being the Lord God himself. But there is one God and idols can do nothing. And so, you know, when a nation goes and worships, you know, a false religion, false gods, they're going to be left with nothing in the times of difficulties, you know. And, you know, when it comes to this nation of Israel, they decided, well, let's go back to our first husband. Now, I want us to be careful about this. I've been teaching the men down here to be careful when you preach, or when you build Bible doctrine, don't build it on illustrations. And, you know, I, I, I explained that, you know, God was not literally married to the nation of Israel or to the nation of Judah. Otherwise, you could easily make a case that God is a polygamist because he was married to two, you know, wives, Israel and Judah. You know, when, we, when the Bible gives us illustrations, it's just to help us understand what is going on, some doctrinal truth, Okay. Now, when we consider that Israel is saying that she's going to return to her first husband, this implies that she had a second husband or a third husband, right? That she was, even though she left her first husband, that she was married to a, at least a second husband. And again, this is symbolic. This is all symbolic. Because if you take this to teach on divorce and marriage, you're going to be left with the idea that you could leave your second husband or your second wife and be reunited with your first or second wife or husband. Okay? That is against the word of God. Please keep your finger there. And let's go to Deuteronomy chapter 24. Deuteronomy chapter 24, please. Deuteronomy chapter 24. And so, you know, it's, it's using marriage and divorce illustrative. illustrative you know, in this relationship between Israel and God. And if you go, you know, if, while you're turning there, just back in uh, Hosea chapter 2 and verse number 2, it said that, uh, it's, it said, uh, neither am I her husband. It said, sorry, for she is not my wife, neither am I her husband. And so God uses this language as though they've had a divorce, okay? And now Israel is wanting to come back to her first husband, right? Again, implying that she was married to at least a second husband, right? But in Deuteronomy 24, verse number 1, it says, When a man have taken a wife and married her, that's the first husband, and it come to pass that she find no favor in his eyes, because he have found some uncleanness in her, then let him write her a bill of divorcement and give her in her hand and send her out of his house. And when she's departed out of his house, she may go and be another man's wife. So now she's got a second husband. And if the latter husband hate her and write her a bill of divorcement and giveth it in her hand and sendeth her out of his house, or if the latter husband die, which took her to be his wife, okay, so the second husband either divorces or passes away. Verse number four, her former husband, that's the first husband, which sent her away, may not take her again to be his wife. After that, she is defiled. For that is abomination before the Lord, 
and thou shalt not cause the land to sin, which the Lord thy God giveth thee for an inheritance. So God makes it very clear that if you've been married to your first, and then you marry a second, you cannot go back for whatever reason and be reunited with your first spouse. Okay? And so this is black and white commandments of God. It cannot be done. Then when we look at Hosea and we see illustratively, you know, Israel wanting to go back to a first husband, we know that we cannot take the doctrine of marriage and divorce from this illustration. Okay? It is only there to serve a purpose of giving us some visual aid of what it's like for God to have this nation turn its back against him as though she was adulterous, as though there was some type of divorce, though we know that marriage is not between God and a nation. Marriage is between a man and his wife. Okay? So we have to be careful not to build doctrines on illustrations. Build your doctrines on the clear commandments of God. Let's go to verse number 8. Verse number 8. Now we're going to see God's judgment on Old Testament Israel here. Verse number 8. For she did not know that I gave her corn and wine and oil and multiplied her silver and gold, which they prepared for Baal. So he's saying, look, you know how she thought she got all of those possessions because of the false gods. God is saying she doesn't even know that I was the one that gave it to her. Okay. Verse number 9. Therefore will I return and take away my corn in the time thereof and my wine in the season thereof and will recover my wool and my flax given to cover her nakedness. And so the first judgment that falls upon Israel is that they're going to lose their possessions and their wealth. Of course, this comes with the Assyrians. As the Assyrians come and conquer them, they're going to lose their possessions and wealth. You know, God, God blesses us. And if we're wicked people, if we sin against the Lord, God can easily remove all the blessings, all the possessions that He has given to us on this earth. Hey, we can even lose our rewards. Say, if we live in a wicked way, there are rewards in heaven that God did want to give us in eternal life, but that we're going to lose that because we did not live after His ways. Let's keep going. Verse number 10. And now will I discover her lewdness in the sight of her lovers, and none shall deliver her out of mine hand. And so the second judgment to fall upon Israel here is that they will be brought to shame before God, right? He's going to discover her lewdness, you know? She's going to be like a... What's the word I'm looking for? You know, she's going to... Her shame's going to be put on show, you know, to the, to the surrounding nations and the people of the land. Uh, verse number 11. I will also cause all her mirth to cease. Her feast days, her new moons and her Sabbaths. These are all the feast days. And all her solemn feasts. And so the third judgment to fall upon Old Testament Israel here is that they will lose their national identity as the people of God. Don't forget all these feasts, the Sabbaths, these were all things that were unique to the, um, to the Israelites that showed as a type the coming of Jesus Christ, the sacrifice of Jesus Christ. All these things were to point us to Christ. And so they as a nation were a peculiar people, right? They were a peculiar nation and they stood out as the people of God, but God will even remove all these things that gave them a national identity as the people of God. Verse number 12, And I will destroy her vines and her fig trees, so all the farming, right? Whereof she have said, These are my rewards that my lovers have given me, and I will make them a forest, and the beasts of the field shall eat them. So, you know, the farmland, all the stuff they've grown is going to be overrun by wilderness, you know, forests, you know, all kind of wild vegetation. And uh, verse number 13, And I will visit upon her the days of Balaam, that's the false god that they worshipped, wherein she burned incest, incense to them, and she decked herself with her earrings and her jewels, and she went after her lovers and forgot me, saith the Lord. So again, you can see, that this woman that is unfaithful is not Gomer, it is Israel, okay? Israel. Now, what we looked at was God's judgment that would fall upon the northern kingdom of Israel. What we're about to read from verse number 14 is Israel's deliverance. Not how God will judge Old Testament Israel, but how God will now deliver Israel. Now, this is a really important time to pause and explain a couple of things. Number one, as an independent Baptist, you know, my, my brethren, most of the brethren that I have, I, I caught up with a pastor just this past week. 
uh, for, for the interview that I want to do for a documentary. And, you know, he's a dispensationalist. You know, he's very much uh, sees uh, that one day God will reinstate the physical Old Testament nation of Israel. The Jews at some point will come back to the Lord Jesus Christ. And look, I'm a non-dispensation. In fact, I'm an anti-dispensation. I'm against dispensationalism. You know, I, I think it's an unnecessary and confusing uh, framework of interpretation that a lot of people use. But that's just the reality of you know, our type of church, that there are many uh, people, many saved brethren, many people that I love and care about that are dispensationalists, okay? And so the dispensationalist view of what we're about to read from verse number 14 is that Israel's deliverance is that God will bring them. And, you know, they, they tend to think about what happened in 1948 when the nation of Israel, the modern day of the nation of Israel was re, uh, you know, came, when, when the people came back into the land, they reestablished that nation. They see that as a partial fulfillment of God's promise to deliver Israel. Now, here's the problem with that. We can see here that God's judgment fell upon them for believing a false religion, for following after false gods. You know what? Even to this day, the Jews of the land have a false religion. They have a false god. Okay? They, they literally bow their heads and worship a wall. Okay? So, I mean, do, are you going to tell me that now God's bringing them back into the land even though they're still in defiance against God, even though they're still committing spiritual whoredoms, that God's using that land and those people somehow? Of course not. All right? Now, what did we learn in chapter 1? Chapter 1 is that God had done away with the physical nation, but the people that are saved in that physical nation, the Jews, or the, sorry, the Israelites, I should say, because they were the northern kingdom, and the believers, you can go back and listen to chapter 1, prove this from the Bible, that they make up all Israel. The New Testament spiritual nation of Israel of God is not of one race, it's not of one DNA or one type of blood. You know, it is made up of all people that are in Jesus Christ. And I say this because as we read these passages, I want you to have this in view. And as we get toward the end, this will be confirmed once again. This is not speaking about Old Testament Israel, but speaking about the spiritual nation of God, Jews and Gentiles in Jesus Christ. Let's, let's start there in verse number 14. Therefore, behold... I will allure her and bring her into the wilderness and speak comfortably unto her. So we saw God's judgment to them. But God says, look, uh, there's coming a time when I'm going to bring her and I'm going to speak comfortably. I'm going to speak words of comfort to this nation. What nation? Again, it's a spiritual nation that God is speaking about here. I'll prove that to you shortly. And of course, there is no greater comfort. There is no greater comfort, brethren, than the gospel. Salvation. Being sure that you're going to heaven. Being sure that you're right with God. Knowing for certain that you will not go to hell because you received Jesus Christ in faith. There's no greater comfort than that. All right. Verse number 15. And I will give her her vineyards from thence and the valley of Achor for a door of hope and she shall sing there as in the days of her youth. And as in the day when she came out of the land of Egypt. And so God is saying that these people that he comforts, they're going to be singing praises to God. Just like the Old Testament Israel, when, when, Israelites, when they came out of the land of Egypt and they sang the song of Moses, they, they, they worshipped and, and made a joyful noise unto the Lord. God is saying in the same way that these people will be singing praises to God like the Israelites of old. Verse number 16. And it shall be at that day, saith the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishai, and shall call me no more Baali. For I will take away the names of Balaam out of her mouth, and they shall no more be remembered by their name. And so God is saying, look, there's coming a time when Balaam, again, that's the false gods, that you're not going to uh, worship those false gods anymore. You know, those that are comforted by Jesus Christ, those that are comforted by the gospel and become people of God and sing praises to God, they're not going to seek after false gods. They're not going to get themselves, they're not going to be following a false religion. All right? Again, speaking of believers. Now, verse number 16 was a little uh, challenging because I don't speak Hebrew, right? 
But I, I did a bit of research on this, and, the, and, and what I got out of the research was pretty consistent. I'll tell you what, what this is. So it says here, and it shall be in that day, verse number 16, save the Lord, that thou shalt call me Ishai. So Ishai means husband, all right? I, again, I, I looked at many sources, and this seemed to be very consistent. So I don't have any doubt to, that this is correct. But maybe how they apply it was, I, I don't necessarily agree with how they apply it. So, so look, there's coming a time when you're going to call me husband. Remember, as an illustration, you know, Israel had gotten divorced from God, okay? But there is coming a time when this union, and listen, there's no greater relationship, there's no closer relationship in this world than between a husband and a wife. So it makes logical sense to me that God will use marriage symbolically as his relationship with his people, with those that believe on Jesus Christ, okay? So we'll call him husband, and then it says this, and shall call me no more Bailey, okay? Now, Bailey means master or Lord. Now, of course, Jesus Christ is the Lord, okay? So what we're learning here is that, you know, there's coming a time where God is not some sort of distant Lord and master. It's not like, it's not that he just has authority, because husbands have authorities over their, over their wife, don't, do they not? So it's not just that God has authority over his people, but <clears throat> there will be a close fellowship, a close relationship, as, as it were, between a husband and a wife. And so God is not some distant God like what Islam teaches. You know, the Muslim teach that God is just simply unknowable. He's too, just too great. Just, just, and, and of course, God is great. Okay? But they don't think anybody can know what God is like. And yet God tells us we can be close to God. And God reveals a lot about himself to us through his words. So, you know, the fact that you're calling him husband rather than just Lord or Master means that there will be a close fellowship, right? And again, marriage here being used symbolically because there's no close relationship than between husband and wife. And also when it says Bailey, and then in verse number 17, Balem, I know these words sound very similar. They do have obviously a very similar root word. And so Balaam, even though it's a name of a false god, it comes from the term of master or lord. Okay. So it's not saying that it's the same term, even though it has a very similar root word there. Now, the reason this is important, please keep your finger there. Let's go to Revelation 19. Revelation 19. Because what we will soon see is that God is pointing us to the millennium, the millennial reign of Christ. When Christ comes back in his second coming, sets up his kingdom for a thousand years, and we're going to rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Well, just before Christ comes to rule on this earth for a thousand years, we have Revelation 19 and verse number 7. Revelation chapter 19 and verse number 7. And the Bible reads, Let us be glad and rejoice and give honor to him, for the marriage of the Lamb is come. And his wife have made herself ready. Remember God spoke about a time when we're going to call him husband, as it were. Well, the wife has gotten herself ready here for the lamb. Verse number 8. And to her was granted that she should be arrayed in fine linen, clean and white. For the fine linen is the righteousness of saints. So this wife, symbolic wife, is made up of believers, of the saints. Okay? And the clothing, you know how a, a, a woman wears white on her wedding day? Well, that white linen is the righteousness of the saints. Again, it's the imputed righteousness of Jesus Christ. And in the new man, of course, we're going to have new resurrected bodies by then. All acts that we do will be righteous. None of it will be filthy rags done in accordance to the desires of the flesh, but rather by the will of God. All right, verse number nine. And he saith unto me, Right, blessed are they which are called unto the marriage supper of the Lamb, and he saith unto me, these are the true sayings of God. And so in the end times, we see again uh, marriage being used to symbolize Christ's coming millennial kingdom and how he's going to rule and reign with his saints. Okay. So again, that symbolism is used. And when we look at Hosea, it's looking to that time when there's that close union once again between God and and his people. All right, let's go to chapter, uh, sorry, back to Hosea chapter 2, verse number 18. Now, verse, chapter, uh, verse number 18 proves that this is about the millennium because it says here, and in that day 
will I make a covenant for them with the beasts of the field and with the fowls of heaven and with the creeping things of the ground. And I will break the bow, bow and the sword and the battle of the earth and will make them to lie down safely. God is saying there's coming a time when he established a new covenant with all the animals, all the beasts of the field. There'll be no more sword, there'll be no more fighting, there'll be no more wars, okay? And of course, we still have wars today, right? And uh, you talk about what is this uh, covenant? Well, if you want to keep your finger there, I can read it to you quickly, but it's Isaiah chapter 11. You can go there if you want. Isaiah chapter 11, verse number 6. Isaiah chapter 11 and verse number 6, the Bible reads, The wolf also shall dwell with the lamb, and the leopard shall lie down with the kid, and the calf and the young lion and the fatling together, and a little child shall lead them. God is telling us in Isaiah 11 that it's coming a time when all animals will basically be domesticated. Okay, A little child will be able to have a lion for a pet. Right? And, uh, you know, what we consider as uh, carniv uh, carniv carnivorous animals, they will not be eating uh, animals. You know, all animals will be vegetarian. That, of course, comes in the millennial reign of Jesus Christ. And it keeps going, verse number 7. And the cow and the bear shall feed, their young ones shall lie down together, and the lion shall eat straw like, an, like the ox. There it is. Instead of the lion eating meat, it's eating straw. Verse number 8. And the suckling child, a little, little baby, shall play on the hole of the asp, that's a snake, and the weaned child shall put his hand on the cockatrice den. They shall not be hurt, nor destroy in all my holy mountain, for the earth shall be full of the knowledge of the Lord, as the waters cover the sea. So a few things there, when Christ comes in his millennial reign, all animals domesticated, no wild animals, little children will be able to play with snakes, they won't be bitten, they won't die, from, from venom, but not only that, the entire world will have knowledge of God, okay? Now, this ties in neatly with what we saw in Hosea chapter 2, verse number 18. Let's keep going there. Let's keep going. Let's go back there. Hosea chapter 2, verse number 19. It says, And I will betroth thee unto me forever. Okay, so the betrothed there as though it were a, a, a wedding between husband and wife, okay? But notice that it is one that is forever, forever. This is teaching us eternal security. You know, once you're in Jesus Christ, once you're in this New Testament in Christ, you have eternal life forever, brethren. No matter what happens, you can never lose your salvation. It says, Yea, I will betroth thee unto me in righteousness. Of course, that's the righteousness of Christ. And in judgment, and in love and kindness, and in mercies, I will even betroth thee unto me in faithfulness, and thou shalt know the Lord. And so you see that the relationship that God is speaking about here is not like the Old Testament relationship between God and that physical nation which came to an end. When the New Testament came into effect, when Jesus Christ died on the cross, the New Testament came in and the Old Testament was done away with. That was not an everlasting or, you know, it wasn't a, a forever relationship in that physical king, uh, nation. But rather... The New Testament is one that is forever. You know, under the Old Covenant, you could be an unsaved person and still be in that covenant with God because you're of Israel and you're carrying about, you're doing the, the you know, uh, the rituals, you're doing the sacrifices, you're doing all these things. There are a lot of people like, there are many Jews like that, many Israelites doing that, but they were not the people of God. Okay, God rejected them because they followed after false gods. And so, you know, the old covenant, even though it was, a, it was a good covenant and God blessed the people when they were doing right, it wasn't made up of only believers. It, that, that old covenant was made up of non-believers and believers, okay? And if they did what God required of them, they would be blessed on the land. But again, only believers would go to heaven and unbelievers, no different today, would go to hell. But when it comes to the new covenant that Jesus Christ brought in through his sacrifice, you can only enter into that covenant as a believer. A non-believer cannot enter into the New Testament covenant you know, without believing on Jesus Christ. And so it is a better covenant. It is a better testament. Only made up for believers. This is why this one can be one of eternal, uh, an eternal nature. You know, as it were, betrothed forever to God. And so the relationship is everlasting in that sense. Okay, let's keep going. Verse number one, 21. 
And it shall come to pass in that day, I will hear, saith the Lord, I will hear the heavens, and they shall hear the earth. And the earth shall hear the corn and the wine and the oil, and they shall hear Jezreel. So let's break this down a little bit. We know this is about the millennium, okay? And we already saw in Isaiah that the entire world will have a knowledge of God. And so what God is saying here is that He's going to hear from heaven, like all of, all, all of creation will give glory to God in the millennium. All the beasts of the field, all of you know, the heavens, the, 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 the clouds, you know, the sun, the moon, you know, the, the trees, the, the, the creatures, the people on the earth, everything, all of creation will give God the glory. And how, I like how 22 ends, verse number 22. It says, and they shall hear Jezreel. Now you may remember that Jezreel was the firstborn son between Hosea and Gomer. And he was called Jezreel because that was a city in Israel, in the northern kingdom of Israel, that was known for its wickedness. Okay? But here's the thing. In the millennium, that city will also give God the glory. That city will also praise God. Okay? Because it is a righteous kingdom. Okay? The kingdom of Jesus Christ will be a righteous kingdom over the entire world. And so we can see how when Christ comes back, it's not going to be... It, how things are right now. I mean, we know that God's wrath and judgment will fall upon the earth before His kingdom. So the face of this earth will look totally different anyway. And then when Christ comes, He's going to have that perfect government. He's going to have that you know, perfect uh, law of righteousness which people are going to be governed by in that time. Okay, verse number 23. Now, this is really important. Notice verse number 23. I told you that how it started with the physical nation that God is rejecting, and now it concludes with the spiritual nation of Israel that rule and reign with Jesus Christ. Those that are Jews and Gentiles in Christ, okay, that will rule with Jesus Christ in the millennium. Look at verse number 23. God says, and I will sow her unto me in the earth. So God's going to multiply his people. And I will have, look at this, I will have mercy upon her that had not obtained mercy. And I will say to them which were not my people, Thou art my people. And they shall say, Thou art my God. The title for the sermon this evening is, Thou art my God. Hey, who can say these words? I tell you who can say it. I can say those words. You can say those words. Because we are God's people. Because God's shown us mercy by His grace and through His gospel. And because of that, which we who were not His people are now his people now the dispensationalists will say well see the physical nation of israel will yeah god said they're not his people but now he's making them his people again now this is where you need to understand the difference between the opinions of man and just believe in the clear words of god you know believe in what the bible tells us about this passage let's go to first peter chapter 2 First Peter chapter 2, and I know I preached for First Peter not too long ago, so this will just refresh your memory. But First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. First Peter chapter 2 and verse number 9. Hosea chapter 2 verse 23 gets repeated, okay, by the apostle Peter. So Peter, who was a disciple of Jesus Christ, an apostle, okay, a pastor, this is what he teaches under the influence of the Holy Spirit, mind you. As he penned these words, verse number 9, 1 Peter chapter 2, verse number 9. It says, But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation. Is that speaking about the Old Testament nation? No. A peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who have called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Okay, who is, who is Peter speaking to? Look at verse number 10. Which in time past were not a people. Hey, Peter is quoting Hosea now. Which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God, <clears throat> which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. Hey, Peter is explaining what Hosea wrote about. He's making it easy for us to understand in the New Testament. Verse number 11. Dearly beloved, I beseech you as strangers and pilgrims, abstain from fleshly lusts which war against the soul, 
having your conversational, that's your behavior, honest among the Gentiles, that whereas they speak against you as evildoers, they may by your good works, which they shall behold, glorify God in the day of visitation. And so, brethren, what do we learn there? We learn that when Hosea was quoting about the people that God will have mercy on, the people that would become God's people, and that those same people could say about God, Thou art my God, which is the title for the sermon this evening, that they would be those that were Gentiles, Jews, those in Jesus Christ. We've gone through First Peter recently. You know what I'm saying to be true. Okay? And so, Hosea is not... Let me make this very clear. Hosea is not prophesying that the Old Testament Israelites that rejected God with their false religion, that somehow they're going to make a comeback in the millennium. No, they've been rejected. God told them, you are no longer my people. I am no longer your God. We saw that in chapter 1. And so what we see is the transition to the New Testament. Believers of all nations in Jesus Christ. Hosea wrote about us. He wrote about us in chapter 1. He wrote about us in chapter 2. And God is showing us the great promise to come. The promise that should have been for the people of that land. You know, the unbelievers. They should have believed on Jesus Christ. But hey, Hosea was one. Amos was another. You know, and there were many, many other uh, Jews and Israelites of those days that did believe on the Lord. Hey, and we're going to be ruling and reigning with those people, those believers. We're going to be onefold. We're going to have one shepherd over us, the Lord Jesus Christ. And I can't wait to rule and reign with him for a thousand years. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, I just want to thank you for the book of Hosea. Uh, thank you for the great spiritual truths that we see here, Lord. Uh, Lord, um, again, we see replacement theology in view here. And it surprises me, Lord, how so many people have swallowed the lie of dispensationalism. Lord, I pray that you would open their eyes. Lord, I do love many of these pastors and friends of mine that have been deceived. Lord, I pray you would open their eyes and, and Lord, uh, to appreciate this great truth that when we read the book of Hosea, it's written unto us. And Lord, it can be so tempting to believe the lie of dispensationalism and to conclude that Hosea, well, that has nothing to do with us. That has nothing to do with the New Testament church, as they like to say. But truly, Lord, these are words that you've written for our knowledge, Lord. You've written it for our, uh, to motivate us, Lord, to look forward to that time when we can be with Christ, that, that new earth, although it's not the new earth just yet, but the, you know, how, how God will establish a new covenant with all of creation. And Lord, I can't wait to, to see what it'll be like to, to rule and reign with him. We thank you so much for your promises. We pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen.